As if by royal appointment, the weather on the great day is perfect, giving London a touch of summer magic. From Buckingham Palace, a semi-state Landau carries the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh to St. Paul's Cathedral to the wedding of their much-loved son, the Prince of Wales. As the Queen Mother said for all of us, I wouldn't have missed this day for anything. On the steps of St Paul's, it's a scene straight from a Victorian picture book. the enchanting bridesmaids with wreaths of flowers in their hair, and the page boys, straight and slim, in 19th century sailor suits, all under the firm but pretty eye of Lady Sarah Armstrong Jones, the chief bridesmaid. The wedding guests assemble, not just the famous like Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and Mrs. Nancy Reagan, wife of the American president, but personal and family friends as well. Also, many of the crowned heads of Europe, quite happy for once to play second fiddle. The huge, cheerful crowd that has waited so long and patiently roars and waves its welcome. the hero of the hour. Beneath the pomp and titles, a nice, rather nervous young man on the most tender and important journey of his life. Beside him, his brother and chief supporter, Prince Andrew, wondering perhaps if he's forgotten the ring. As Prince Charles sets off for the cathedral, his mother arrives to be greeted, as tradition in the city demands, by the Lord Mayor of London. The Queen Mother, escorted by Prince Edward. Around the 1902 State Landau rides a Prince of Wales escort of the Household Cavalry, gleaming and bright. An escort of mounted police wait for Lady Diana at Clarence House. Though still a commoner, the pretty English girl will be transformed into the third Lady of the Realm, Princess of Wales. In St Paul's, the Queen and other members of the royal family make their way past the other 3,000 wedding guests to take their places. The Duke and Duchess of Kent, the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester, Princess Margaret and Viscount Linley, and Princess Anne with Captain Mark Phillips. The Queen is preceded by the Lord Mayor, bearing the pearl sword presented to the city by Queen Elizabeth I, to commemorate the victory over the Armada in 1588. And so 
so the stage is set. And here is the groom, exactly on time, punctuality being the privilege of princes. Prince Charles wears a uniform of Royal Navy Commander, his brother that of midshipman. Passing through Admiralty Arch, the bride is not far behind. At her side, her father, the Earl Spencer. Prince Charles makes his way down the aisle. His supporters, Prince Edward with Prince Andrew, still hoping he hasn't lost the ring. For swearing the usual privilege of brides, Lady Diana arrives on time as well. The whole day is to be a superb example of precision and timing, so typical of British ceremonial. The world gets its first full glimpse of the fairy tale princess, demure behind her veil, and the wedding dress that has been a carefully guarded secret, resplendent ivory silk taffeta trimmed with antique lace and a long, long train, all 25 feet hand embroidered. As bewitching and romantic a bride as ever touched the heart of the world. But that long train is a bridesmaid's nightmare. On her father's arm, Lady Diana Spencer sets off to join the Prince of her heart. orchids and pale gardenias, dark myrtle and golden Mount Batten roses. So Charles and Diana come together before God and the world to make their vows, each to the other. The service is to be taken by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Charles Philip Arthur George, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her, so long as ye both shall live? I will. Diana Francis, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband, to live together according to God's law in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love him, comfort him, honor and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live? I will. 
Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? I, Charles Philip Arthur George. I, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee, Diana Francis. Take thee, Diana Francis. To my wedded wife. To my wedded wife. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And thereto I give thee my troth. And thereto I give thee my troth. I, Diana Francis. I, Diana Francis. Take thee, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee, Philip Charles Arthur George. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And thereto I give thee my troth. And thereto I give thee my troth. There, he hadn't lost the ring after all. With this ring, with this ring, I thee wed, I thee wed. With my body, with my body, I thee honor, I thee honor. And all my worldly goods with thee I share. With all thy goods with thee I share. Let us pray. And so the knot is tied. Those whom God has joined together, let no man put asunder. For as much as Charles Philip Arthur George and Diana Francis have consented together in holy wedlock and have witnessed the same before God and this company and thereto have given and pledged their troth either to other and have declared the same by giving and receiving of a ring and by joining of hands. I pronounce that they be man and wife together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Charles and Diana, now man and wife, move up to the high altar for the blessing. God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always.
highnesses, the Prince and Princess of Wales, make their way back down the aisle to the tumultuous welcome awaiting them at the steps of St. Paul's. And so, out into sunshine and bells and wild delight, as a palpable wave of affection and pride wells out from the crowd. Suddenly, that long train makes the state landau look remarkably full. As their families look on, with what emotions in their hearts, the Prince and Princess of Wales begin their first public journey, returning through the packed streets of London to Buckingham Palace. those who say that the monarchy has no relevance to modern British life. Obviously, a lot of people don't agree. Behind the newlyweds comes the Queen, accompanied by the Earl Spencer. The Duke of Edinburgh with the bride's mother, Mrs. Shand Kidd. The Queen Mother with Prince Andrew. Who can doubt the love and happiness that this couple so obviously feel and share? So strong that for one inspiring day, a whole nation can forget its troubles to unite in wishing them well. The bridal carriage draws up at the grand entrance to Buckingham Palace on as grand and happy a day as summer sun looked down on.
Lady Sarah straightens out a few last problems with that train. Close behind the bridal couple, the Queen's carriage procession arrives. Session over, the crowd rushes for the traditional vantage point of the palace railings. Whilst behind a slender police cordon, the mall fills with people like a thermometer fills with mercury. And this is what they're waiting for, an appearance on the balcony of Buckingham Palace which has seen so many royal and national occasions in the past. receives a roar of approval from the crowd, who call the couple back and back again onto the balcony. It's hard to argue with half a million people who know what they want. Every single one was rewarded by this tender kiss. At last, photographs taken, wedding breakfast eaten, toast drunk, and after fond farewells, the young couple managed to get away on their honeymoon. A thoroughly unofficial addition to the 1902 state landau. Balloons decorated with the Prince of Wales feathers and a notice proclaiming, just married, in case anyone didn't know. It seems that princes of the blood or not, younger brothers are much the same everywhere. Queen Victoria may not have been amused, but everyone else was. It's obvious even trite, to describe this tale of the beautiful maid who marries the handsome prince as a fairy story. It's certainly sentimental to do so, but what's wrong with that? All the best fairy stories end with the words, and they all lived happily ever after. May we pray that this fairy story is no exception.